just as often. Okay, uh, for the last 12 some odd weeks, for some of you it probably seems like 24 weeks, I've been doing a series called Images, right? And we've been using um, very beautiful artistic photographs taken by our guest speaker today, Michael Belk, taken in Italy. And in the culture that we live in today, if you use an image to convey a truth or a message, that image will be used to help that person retain the information in far greater percentage than not using an image. It's because of the culture that we live in. We're image driven. And when I first saw uh, the coffee table book that was given to me at uh, a dinner party, which there are some available in the back, for which I hope we buy them all after the service, I got to looking at these images and I thought, what a wonderful summer series that would really give us a, a picture of the image of the invisible God. And uh, I've thrown in some pieces of art here and there from Rembrandt and some other people, but for the most part, Michael's uh, artwork has been used to convey the truth in this church over the last three, four months, and we'll conclude that series next Sunday. Anyway, we talked on the phone. He's so gracious uh, to give us permission to use his images, and we are going to strategically continue to use them for, for, uh, for the God's glory. But I thought it might be interesting uh, to listen to the stories behind the images and to see what we can learn about what it is we have learned. Uh, so without further ado, let's give a warm mountain welcome to Michael Belk. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning. Hey, this is exciting. Thank you so much, Gary, for having me here, and thank you all for allowing me to share your Sunday morning with you. I think you'll enjoy what you see here this morning. I find it incredibly amazing how God will give us gifts. Uh, for some, it's money. For some, it's possessions, talent, skills. And then in his perfect timing, he sits back for an opportunity to ask us to use all of those gifts for his glory. Well, so here I was six years ago just minding my own business, enjoying a, a life, a successful life as a fashion photographer. When God comes and taps me on the shoulder and he says, Michael, how'd you like to go to Italy and do some photos? I said, Italy? I absolutely love Italy. He says, better yet, what if we used Italy as a backdrop to take pictures of my son? I said, Italy and Jesus? How can it get any better than that? What can we do next? Let me show you what happens. I'm Michael Belk. Sometimes the only information we have about God, Jesus, and Christianity is often distorted. We may know Christianity from our childhood, being made to sit still in church for hours, or from something we have seen on television. Others may know nothing at all about Christianity. My desire is for you to put aside any past ideas you may have about Jesus and simply listen to what he has to say. You may find his words are totally different than what you thought. I know I did. Over the past 30 years, I've had an exciting career as a fashion photographer. Yet during that time, I sensed that God had an even bigger plan for me. Several years ago, I felt God asking, what are you doing with all that I gave you? The time, the talent, are you using it all for yourself or are you sharing it with others? It was time to answer the question. So I put my career on hold and began to pursue a dream I believe God put on my heart. The dream was to create an exhibit of fine art photographs that would depict many of the messages I believe Jesus came to share with us over 2,000 years ago. Then I would display them around the world. The project was an enormous undertaking. 
how all the details came together over the next months is a miracle in itself. But by the fall, our plans were complete and we headed to Italy to the ancient city of Matera. With an amazing Italian actor in the role of Jesus and a cast of more than 100 extras, a production company from Rome and a film crew from America, I set out to create the images that would become Journeys with the Messiah. With these images and timeless messages, it is my desire to portray the character and significance of Jesus Christ from a fresh, innovative, and inviting perspective. And it is my prayer that they will ignite or reignite a passion in you to know more about Jesus who is accepted by many as the Messiah, the Son of God. It is my hope that you will experience a depth of feeling and emotion in these images. Some will be comforting, some enlightening, some will be full of hope, and some will be very challenging. But these are the images I am compelled to share with you about the truth Jesus has shared with me. Uh, guys in the control booth, if y'all want to keep those lights down, that's great. We'll just keep them up on the, so we can have the screens and don't worry about me. Thank you, wherever that's coming from. Um, isn't that just absolutely amazing what God will do when we surrender all of those gifts back to Him? But it wasn't always that way for me. You see, I grew up in the church. Uh, very active in it, but by the time I left for college, I was not a follower of Jesus Christ, and the truth is I knew very little about him. After college, I began building a career as a fashion photographer. It allowed me to travel to many beautiful and exotic places, uh, from the streets of Paris to the outback of Australia, and I got to take pictures of beautiful people for clients that included Nautica and J. Crew and many others. Uh, I got to tell you, it was an exciting life, but it was also a life uh, that lived at a speed that was not safe for anyone. By the world standards, I was what we would call a success. But you know, the year I made the most and the year I had the most was also the year I was the most miserable. Something was missing in my life. Eventually, this uh, jet-setting pace that I lived at took its toll on me, and I crashed and burned, both physically and emotionally, and I spiraled into a darkness that seemed to get even darker as I began to understand I was not going to be the one who got me out of this. C.S. Lewis wrote about this one time. He said, God has this really annoying habit of stepping into our lives, even when we've pulled in the welcome mat and bolted the door says God knows how to throw a great party, but he also knows how to spoil one. <laughs> well, <laughs> he had spoiled mine, and in my darkest hour, he came to visit me and talk to me about it, and like a neighbor coming over for a cup of coffee, he said, what now, Michael? Would you like to continue your way, or would you like to give my way a try? And I admitted to him that I'd lived it all for myself, and in doing that, I'd lost my way. And I didn't know the way anymore, and I wanted to give his way a try. Well, when the sun rose the next morning, it seemed as if absolutely nothing had changed in my life. But what I learned later is a journey started that night, a journey that I had, would have no idea that would have me standing here in front of you this morning talking about it. How about that? In 2004, I opened a beautiful gallery in uh, a resort in Florida. And it was such a peaceful place that uh, I thought it could be a sanctuary where maybe vacationers could come for a moment of quiet. And then I got to thinking, what if all of the images in here depicted messages of Christ? 
Well, over time, this idea grew, and I think it was in 2006, I heard Bruce Wilkinson speak, you know, Bruce from the Prayer of Jabez, Bruce speak on this new book called The Dream Giver. And in it, he talked about this dream that he believes God places on all of our hearts and how we will remain restless until we discover that dream. And boy, that spoke deeply to my soul. And I started to tell people about this dream I believe God was putting on my heart, this dream to create this collection of, of photographs that would depict messages of Christ. You see, there were a couple of things in, in my heart at the time. It was one, if I could get my friends to see Jesus as I was seeing him, maybe they wouldn't fear him but, but embrace him. And there was this other group of people who told me, oh, we know Jesus, you know, we're Christians, but they seemed to be limiting him to just Sunday mornings and emergencies and maybe a wedding or a funeral and leaving him out of their day-to-day -day life and knowing the joy of what that was to, to know Christ on an hour-by-hour, moment-by-moment basis. I was so passionate about creating these images that my wife Cheryl and I uh, planned a trip to Israel to do some scouting, but then another big old-fashioned job came along, and I went off, as they say, to chase the Almighty Buck instead of the Almighty. Fortunately, God continued to knock on that door, and as I was about to turn 60, <laughs> it's a big moment in everybody's life, as I was about to turn 60, I asked Cheryl, who, by the way, is sitting back there making these slides appear for you, and the last thing she tells me is, stick to the script. <laughs> Sometimes I go ad lib and get her off of things. So I'll stick to the script, honey. Uh, but I asked Cheryl, I said, what if I die this year and I haven't done this? After God has trained me for 30-plus years, given me the resources, given me the idea, how will I explain to him why I didn't do that? So we decided we, we needed to get going. So we, we made a decision to close the gallery and to put my fashion career on hold and go pursue this dream. Well, the first thing I learned is that when God challenges us to go on a journey like this, he does not take the first step. But as soon as I took that leap of faith, which looks kind of like this, <laughs> but it feels like you don't have a parachute on. He took the next step by showing us where we were going to create this project, the incredible ancient city of Matera, Italy. And when I saw it, wow, I knew the journey had begun. So the next um, months were filled with planning and research, and it all went beautifully well until just a couple of months before the shoot was to start. When my, um, when my producer in Rome told me that my plans had wildly exceeded my budget and that the project would cost three times what we originally estimated. Well, Cheryl and I talked it over and we agreed boldly, there is no turning back, we're moving forward. We had no idea that in just two months that the stock market was going to crash followed by the housing market, and that it would eventually take our entire life savings with it. Ah, now it's going to be a different journey. It's going to be our journey with the Messiah, a journey in which we're going to have to learn to trust in God's provision because we can't trust in our own anymore. Let me tell you, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey. Now, I knew that I could create uh, great images but I knew that only God could touch people's hearts. So I told God, I will take the cameras and do the planning and everything, but you've got to come to Italy with me and somehow be in these images if they're going to touch people's hearts. We even had this director's chair made. <laughs> and we carried it from set to set. We wanted both our American and our, and our uh, Italian crew to know that this wasn't, this wasn't us. This is, this is God's project. And, uh, and he's in charge of this project. And of course, we were always daring people to sit down in the chair, but uh, <laughs> we never got any takers on that. When the, uh, when the project was launched, uh, I was live on CNN for three minutes. And in the next days, we started hearing from around the world, people, pastors, prisoners, just pouring their hearts out about how moved they were by these images. 
and we knew that God had inhabited our prayers and that he had come to Italy and he had made himself part of these images. So we're going to explore just a few of them this morning. I wish we could do them all, but we'd be here till tomorrow morning. Um, but we're going to explore a few and, you know, just sit back and enjoy them. Uh, let God speak to your heart as I take you on your own little personal journey with the Messiah this morning. So this first image uh, I call Faith and Trust. It gets its inspiration from a story about this traveler in the wilderness. And he comes to this big canyon, and wanting to get across, he sees a cable going from that side to this side. And then he sees this guy walking across pushing a wheelbarrow. When the guy with the wheelbarrow gets to his side, the traveler's just amazed. Wow, that, that is just absolutely incredible. And the guy with the wheelbarrow says, you think I can do it again? And the traveler says, absolutely, man. You walked across with such confidence like somebody walking down the sidewalk or something. He says, you sure you think I can do it again? He says, absolutely. He says, well, hop in. Let me take you across. Every one of our images began with a message. We did not come up with a image and then say let's create a message to go with that there was a message we wanted to share and it was like how can i share this message through an image and the story was of course the one about the canyon about the traveler going through the canyon and telling him he'll take him across the rope and the wheelbarrow i had this uh i had this shot for a long time think about how we we're going to do it and i came to matera twice and came here to the ravine and we searched for hours to find just the right location in which we could string a rope a short distance but make it look like it was going completely across a wide open canyon. And the second trip over, we found this one and, and uh, the crew finally figured out a way to do it and it's been incredibly successful, especially with this beautiful backlight. Uh, the story is a story of faith and trust. Just imagine that uh, you came across somebody who just walked back and forth across this rope with the wheelbarrow just over and over and you watched him do it numerous times and then you know you needed to get across and he said, hop in, I'll take you across. Well, that's the difference between faith and trust. Faith is believing somebody else can do it and trust is trusting in the Lord that he can do it because we've seen him do it so many times. Just to look at it from where we were, it just gave you gave you a really scary feeling. In fact, I wanted to tie a, tie a rope to the Christ figure because I was, a, I was afraid of him falling off that cliff during the photo shoot. Would not have been too cool to kill Jesus on the first day of the shoot, would it? <laughs> you know, we, we all make very bold statements of the, about the faith we have un, until it's tested, until we're challenged to get in that wheelbarrow. Uh, yet every one of our journeys through this life is a series of canyons. My wife and I face that canyon of, of financial uncertainty, as I'm sure some of you do. We, uh, we face the canyon a lot of times of disappointment. We face the canyon of, uh, of uh, broken promises by others. Uh, all of us face these canyons, and I know that every one of you in here are probably facing some of your own canyons today. I sometimes think that maybe God gave me this project so that I could learn to surrender all of my canyons to Him. And I've learned over these last years that He is always waiting to take me across. It doesn't matter how far, it doesn't matter how wide or how deep, it doesn't matter whether He's going to take me across in that wheelbarrow, or if He's carrying me across by piggyback or just pick me up in His arms. He is there always to deliver me safely to the other side. That's an incredible thing. And one of these days, he is going to take me through that final canyon to go live in eternity with him. Amen. All right, this next image uh, I call Quandary. You'll see why. Um, it's based on the story of the rich young ruler that you know very well. And you may recall that the rich young ruler was listening to Jesus speak to his disciples, and he asked Jesus how he could 
uh, you know, participate in this eternal life. And Jesus told him to keep the commandments, and he said, which one? He says, do not murder, uh, do not commit adultery, do not steal, honor your parents. And the rich young ruler kind of arrogantly says, well, I've kept all of those since I was a boy. What else? And Jesus says, well, let's up the ante a little bit here. Let's, um, why don't we do this? Why don't we sell your Ferrari? <laughs> Let's sell your Rolex watch and your Louis Vuitton luggage and then give all that money to the poor. And at that time, you can come and follow me. You can't do a series of, uh, of images like this without doing the story of the rich young ruler, one of Jesus' great parables. Uh, this was probably the image concept that in the beginning started us thinking in terms of let's add this this 21st century element to it uh you know this one and the woman at the well of having the woman at the well be you know kind of marilyn monroe or or kind of naughty looking or something and so this one just followed right in line that it would just make sense to have the rich young ruler be a rich young ruler and to show as well uh we're in italy you got to have a ferrari you know <laughs> So we ordered this Ferrari uh, to be there on set that day. Uh, we had the whole central section of Matera, you know, blocked off with barricades. The police, uh, the people in Matera were just incredible. The city was just great to us. Um, but uh, <laughs> I turned to my producer, you know, and I said, hey, uh, where's the Ferrari? And uh, he said, I don't know, I'll give him a call. So he calls him and says, well, I'm on the way. Uh, but I got a little problem. He says, what's that? Uh, and he says, well, I've been stopped by the polizia. And uh, he says, uh, but I'll be there. I'll be there shortly. Then he calls back and he says, well, there's more of a problem. Uh, I don't have the right insurance papers for the car and they're arresting me and impounding the car. I guess they're pretty tough on those laws over there. Well, fate would have it that another part of the crew, the film crew, is interviewing the mayor of Matera at exactly the same time. So my producer, Maurizio, walks over to the mayor, rattles off an Italian what's going on. The mayor takes the phone and he tells the polizia on the other end, he says, that car has a date with destiny. That, that, that car, what was he saying? That car has a date on a divine mission you need to let it go. And uh, a few minutes later, we heard the, uh, the roar of that Ferrari as it came down the street. And another really interesting thing is as I put these pictures together, uh, I, had a, I had a book and, and I'd shot all these scenes of Matera on the trips I'd made over there scouting. And on this particular scene, I knew exactly where I wanted to shoot it. And I'd gone to Ferrari's website and I had uh, you know, just made some little clip art to paste in there to show them. Uh, when we got ready to shoot the scene, I called everybody over and I said, bring me my concept book. And I opened it up. It was the exact same Ferrari, same model, same year, set in the exact same position of the photograph. So my concept of how I came up with this, my little picture, is what, you, you know, is what you're seeing in the final thing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Seeing, uh, seeing God show up on a daily basis and show off was kind of a regular thing for us. Uh, uh, this next picture is a great view of Matera. Uh, the Matera dates back thousands of years when people lived in, in caves along this ravine. And, and this area right in front of this cathedral is uh, it's where we were doing that shot. But look up in the top right corner to the, to the church is carved into the rock. Everything there is carved in the rock. It's just an amazing place. And this next picture, uh, this is the rich young ruler's babe, you know, who was sitting in the Ferrari. And she is wearing a very, very expensive Italian designer jacket that we borrowed from a local store, which we panicked when it went missing at the end of the photo shoot. We were uh, all relieved when it was found in my wife's closet. Uh, <laughs> she swears that ain't so. 
We love this, this, uh, this image because um, this image of, honey, turn the next image, okay. I know you're hiding in shame. Uh, <laughs> you know, this image does not suggest that God does not want us to have money and possessions. It's just the opposite. God is the one who uh, supplies us with money and possessions. However, Jesus knew that our attitudes about money, possessions, and many other things in life could become stumbling blocks that would keep us from pursuing other dreams, especially pursuing a relationship with him. You know, my life as a, as a successful fashion photographer gave me such a self-sufficiency self feeling that I didn't feel any need for Jesus in my life. And for the rich young ruler, it was the same. His money, his wealth provided comforts and convenience in such a way that he was self-sufficient and it kept him from pursuing what he really wanted to do, which was to follow Jesus in eternity. Uh, we all have to ask that question to ourselves on a daily basis. Is there anything in me that's keeping me for, from pursuing my dreams and especially pursuing that relationship with Jesus Christ? You see, self-sufficiency will make you hold tight to the things of this world. But when you allow God's sufficiency you'll end up holding tight to those things in your life that really matter. Well, I'm excited that we had uh, communion here this morning because we're going to get to tell a story about it. Um, and I think you'll enjoy this. On the, on the night that Jesus was arrested, as, as we know from right now, he dined with his friends, his disciples. And during the evening, as we did here, he took bread and he broke it and he said, eat this, this is my body. And then he took the wine cup and he said, drink this, this is my blood which has been poured out for you. Now you can imagine as a disciple hearing Jesus say, eat this my body, drink this my blood, like what's he talking about? They had absolutely no clue of what Jesus was talking about. But 2,000 years later, we have the advantage of knowing that Jesus and his, and his disciples were actually having the Passover meal that night. And, uh, you know, Passover, you know, gets its name from a celebration that, that, that the Israelites had when they were freed from Egypt. So let's rewind 1,300 years uh, to Egypt, and you'll recall that God was sending out plagues against uh, Egypt, the Egyptian ruler, the Pharaoh, and that the last plague was going to kill the firstborn child in every family. But God told the Israelites, if you will place the blood of an unblemished lamb on your doorpost, then when the angel of death comes, the angel of death will pass over your home and spare your child. I grew up in the church and, uh, you know, I, I, we, you know, went to the altar and had communion uh, one day uh, out of the month. Uh, and I always knew that the service was going to run longer on those days. Uh, and it was, you know, and it was grape juice and a wafer that stuck to the top of my mouth. I never understood, you know, what it was about other than, you know, I knew the story about, you know, Jesus that night, you know, uh, telling this you know, disciples about the, about the bread and blood and so forth. And then I, I read, uh, you know, the, the, the true story and, and understood what Passover was about and what, um, uh, you, know, and, you know, and how that, you know, interprets and what Jesus was saying that night since it was Passover and what he was telling his disciples. So we had to have the scene. And uh, interestingly enough, we uh, wanted it to be kind of Da Vinci-like. We were able to get the same table that Mel Gibson used in uh, The Passion of the Christ. Actually, The Passion of the Christ, you know, was shot there in Matera. And so we were able to get the same, same table he used. And, uh, but we wanted to set it up to look like Da Vinci. Uh, so as we were getting ready to shoot, I had my interpreter go to each of the guys um, and tell them, show them the, the Da Vinci painting and set them up as much as possible and say, you got to hold this idea. Then there was the idea how we're going to tell this thing. And I said, let's, you know, Jesus was trying to tell them he is the new lamb. He is the new paschal lamb that will be sacrificed so that, so that we can have life. And I said, let's get a real lamb. Well, 
first problem is it's fall. How are we going to get a spring lamb uh, in the fall? But God's a provider, and, and we got one. Uh, the second problem was how would we get a lamb to stay still uh, for one second exposures? Uh, so we had an answer. The crew got together and we prayed. We said, God, we need a miracle here. You know, it's, it will only be through a miracle that a lamb will stay still in a shot. And when we put that lamb in position, his, his back feet are sitting on an apple box in the chair. When he put his paws up on the, paws, hoofs, whatever they call those on a, on a lamb, put them up there. He looked straight at that camera and he did not move for 20 frames. In fact, the disciples moved more than the lamb did. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was a very emotional event because we really saw a miracle happen right there on the spot. And it uh, afterwards, all of the uh, disciples, you know, came around the table. It tears in their eyes, and they had the arms around me, and, and they were trying to say in Italian, "You're, you know, you, you've done a good job. You're a good man. This is great. We're proud to be a part of it." It was a, it was a neat, neat event on a rainy night in a cave in Matera at about 11 o'clock. If, if nothing else transpires in my life other than moving on to eternity, I go in peace after getting to create that. Wow. Um, you know, there's just great joy for all of us who have accepted this gift of grace that, that Jesus Christ, who made the statement that there is no greater gift than to lay down your life for one's friends and then became the only one in all of mankind, in all of history, who could do that for us, laid down his life, that we may live in eternity with him. What, a, what an incredible gift. Now, this is a story worth telling your neighbor. Invite them over for dinner and share this about Passover. Well, I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about this, this actor um, who played our Christ figure. Um, uh, he's incredibly handsome guy, so we've taken the opportunity to have paramedics standing by for the ladies, just in case. No. <laughs> he's, he's handsome. He really is. He's something. Uh, this is Sergio, and uh, he is a well-known actor in Italy. Uh, so wherever we went, we had to wait for you know, the autographs and the photographs. He's really a genuine guy about it. We had many actors to choose from, but there was something about Sergio's eyes that were just so appealing, they were so kind, yet he was so strong, and we found out that he had actually won the Italian version of Survivor. So he's a pretty tough guy as well. Um, we believe that our choice of him was confirmed when Sergio turned 33 just weeks before we started shooting. <laughs> pretty cool, eh? So the day before, uh, the day before we start shooting, uh, I have sent Sergio up to the hair and makeup room and the, and the movie people are, are doing some last minute tests, making sure the hair is all the right length and the beard's the right length. And, and uh, uh, I'm down in my room doing, uh, you know, last minute scheduling and stuff. And, and um, I decided that I'll go up and check on the makeup people, make sure they're happy with everything. What I don't know is that our costume designer has also gone up to the room and put a robe on Sergio because she wants to mark it for trimming the bottom and stuff. So I walk upstairs, walk down the hall, the door's kind of open. I open the door, and this man stands up and turns around. And he looks like this. And I was caught off guard. I get emotional about this six years later. I thought I was looking into the face of Jesus Christ. It was just so, in, so intense to see him this way. And I really thought I was looking in the face of Jesus Christ, and I was speechless. And the hair and makeup team and the costume people and all, they wanted, to, they wanted my approval, and all I could do is hold back the tears and nod. And uh, I left there, and I went back to my room, and I just wept uncontrollably of joy, of course, 
uh, because of the experience that I had. Cheryl comes running out of the other side of the room. What's going on? She thinks maybe Sergio's quit <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, something's, something's gone wrong. And she's trying to get me to tell her, and I can't tell her. I'm just, I'm just w weeping. And finally, when I, when I was able to get just a moment of control, I told her of this experience of, of seeing this face to face for a moment. And, and I think maybe I just got a glimpse of what it's going to be like that day when we take our last breath here and we take our first breath there and we go face to face with this Lord and Savior who gave his life for us, what an event it's going to be. The image daily bread was daily bread from the beginning, but it was never a planned image uh, for, the, um, uh, for the project. Daily bread occurred because of what happened in our economy just as we were leaving to go back to Italy to start shooting. Um, it was late September, uh, early October. The market was starting to fall, but then it was really crashing. And I was just as panicked as everybody else. I mean, all the money I had put away to do this project uh, had literally fallen by 40% at that point. And I had to make a decision of whether to cash that. Uh, uh, the people in Italy needed, you know, needed money advanced and so forth. And so I was just as panicked as everybody else, but you know, God has a way of doing things. And just days before, I was studying A.B. Bruce's training of the 12, and Jesus was talking about the Lord's Prayer, give us day by day the bread we need. And it dawned on me, that's what this whole problem's about. We don't trust him to supply our needs. You know, we, I want my food today and I want my money for the shoot tomorrow. And as it turned out, we had to trust him and go forward with that. So when I got to Italy, I told the crew, I said, I've added a shot. <laughs> of course they, oh my Lord, not another one. I said, I've added a shot. I have no clue what it looks like where we're gonna shoot it, when it's gonna happen, who's gonna be in it, or anything else. I just know that we have to depict the scene of the daily bread. And we were um, on the Adriatic uh, in, the, in the town of Molfetta where we were uh, shooting the Life Savior. And uh, one of my people came to me and says, I, you gotta come see this location. It was a 12th century church courtyard, just beautiful. Uh, so we, we pulled in uh, some, some furniture from a nearby restaurant to have that modern element. And then we pulled in this, you know, modern day guy, uh, dressed him, and we kept, you know, we were trying to put pins in the loaves of bread that had the days of the week and so forth. And, and finally I said, listen, just grab all of the loaves of bread and leave. And then I went over to Sergio and I, and I sat down, you know, across the table from him and I said, now, Let's pretend that you're Jesus and you're in this situation and this guy gets up and walks off with all the loaves, loaves of bread. What are you going to do? And he says, I'd probably laugh at him. I said, great, let's laugh at him. And we shot this shot of Jesus just laughing at the guy. Well, what else would you do? And it just turned out perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see this picture up close, you'll notice Jesus has one small piece of bread and a and, a, and an espresso, and he's happy. <laughs> so, you know, how much of our lives do we spend worrying about whether there'll be enough tomorrow? Jesus tells us that uh, the problem with worrying about tomorrow is it takes us out of today, and that he can only meet us in this day, in this moment, because this is the only place he can meet us to meet our needs. And plus, for many people, tomorrow's not even going to exist. Yet, they're still worried about it. I have this image in my office. And uh, I don't know if we brought that or not. But uh, I, I keep this image in my office. And every time I start getting anxious about something in the future, I turn and I look at this image. And I hear Jesus speaking to me. And he's saying, Michael, come back. Sit down at the table, get yourself a cup of coffee, have a piece of bread, and spend the day enjoying me. I know the plans I have for you, and they are good plans, and you just need not worry about tomorrow. 
That is the most peaceful thing in the world, I've got to tell you. Well, let's go on to another image. How many of you have ever received an invitation in the mail that has RSVP like this written on it? And you've called and made up some silly excuse or written back with some silly excuse as to why you couldn't attend the party or whatever. Really? <laughs> I've never done that either. Um, <laughs> That's good to know that, that y'all have not done that. Well, while dining at the home of a prominent Pharisee, Jesus told this parable about this wealthy man who was going to give this banquet, and he had invited many guests. But when it came time for the guests to come, they started RSVPing, and they, if you go read the scripture, you'll see that they sent some really lame excuses as to why they could not attend his party. Well, the man giving the banquet, he got upset. And he told his servants, he says, I want you to go out in the street and I want you to invite the blind and the lame and the poor and everyone else. And then he says something that we've got to pay attention to. He said, none of those who were invited will ever taste of my great feast until it's too late. Uh, I love that name, RSVP. Uh, that came later on. That was always called the King's Banquet. Been incredible the way the names have come about uh, for these, but there's a great story, uh, a very important story in the gospel where Jesus makes it very clear through this parable that there's a party being given and that, uh, that the invitation's out there and that many people are gonna be too busy to accept that invitation until it's too late. And uh, so we wanted, to, we wanted to create this scene in which we divided the original guests who were invited and the guests that the servant went out in the streets to get, the, the poor, the blind, the lame. So we made all of those people the first century poor, blind, and lame, and then we took the 21st century people and had them all dressed for a cocktail party, tuxedos, evening gowns, and so forth found this great location there in uh, Matera where we could have balustrades set up to create, uh, you know, a divide so that here's this wonderful party. We had a catering company come in, set up the whole catering of this thing with a candelabra and so forth. It took us literally hours to, to light that shot. It was so difficult. And while, while my um, lighting director was telling his guys exactly where he wanted to put uh, where he wanted to put that light to create the feeling that I need because I needed that you know like it's an outdoor party and the candles are or what's lighting the scene I am just standing down on the lower level just watching and all of a sudden I see the angle I'm going to shoot this thing from you know it was never the angle I wanted to shoot it from and here it is and it's just perfect as I watched our Jesus uh, character interacting with the people as everything's getting set up is just perfect. So all they had to do was say, you know, lights are ready, let's go. And it was bang, 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 and it was over. It's done. Hours and hours of setup in just a few seconds to make it happen after that. Love this image, really do. Um, you know, the, the wonderful thing about this is that um, this image is, you know, just depicts such a powerful story. And like, like the story just told you, you know, it tells us that, that Jesus has already sent us an invitation to go to the greatest party that will ever be given in all of mankind. And many of us have already replied, yes, I cannot wait to attend. But like the parable tells, there will be people who will, uh, who will not accept that invitation until the gates of the party are closed. So our responsibility, the Great Commission it's called, is that for all of us who know that story, we are making a huge mistake if we're not sharing that story and letting other people know that everybody has been invited to the party uh, and that, that, that they respond, that they make sure it's not the, the invitation's not on their desk or in their mailbox and that they have gotten that invitation, that we've gotten that invitation and that we have responded positively to G Jesus, that we are coming. This is not a party anybody's going to want to miss. Uh, well, uh, you know, as, uh, as you can see from these images, you know, Journeys with the Messiah is about visually communicating the stories of the gospel. It's just an incredible gift that God has given us. 
and, uh, and we, we share it in every way we can in, in our hope is that, that people who are touched by it will not only seek a deeper relationship with Jesus, but that they will then take it and, and pass it on. So we have developed uh, a website that, that anybody can go to and hear, uh, see all of these stories 24 hours a day. Uh, our books and our resources um, provide you with a powerful way for, for sharing your, um, your testimony, your faith with other people. Um, hey, you know, all you got to do, ooh, there's a idea. Uh, all you have to do is uh, hang a picture of Jesus walking down a country road with a Nazi, and I guarantee you that you're not going to be the one who starts the conversation in your home or office, I can assure you. Um, well, I think we have time for one more, one more image, and then we're going to close today with a slideshow. And I could, I could stand up here and, and tell you my stories of this journey since it started six years ago. Um, I think one of the better ways to sum it up is in the message version in Matthew 10. It says, Jesus says, if you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, then you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you're never going to find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and you look to me, then you'll find yourself and you'll find me. And uh, one other thing, you would think that have had, having the great career as a fashion photographer that I've had, that my best would be behind me. But here I am, 66 years old, and my best is right now. And that's a message, and there's lots more to come, too. And that's a message for you as well. Jesus, regardless of what your age or what your status in, is in life, does not want you sitting down in this chapter of your life. He wants you to keep walking into that next chapter so that he can reveal the rest of the plans he's already made for you. Who but the God of all imagination could take the cross, the most barbaric tool of execution, and turn it into a symbol of hope and faith, a signature of all that is good in the world? There's a wealth of understanding to be discovered at the cross. In the historical account of Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem to find no room in the inn, no vacancy. Yet just 33 brief years later, there was plenty of room for Jesus at the cross. There's room at the cross for you and me too. At the cross, we learn to die to our own needs and learn to live for the needs of others. We learn to die to having it our way and learn to live in His way. And we learn to die to the darkness of this world while opening our eyes to the light of God's world. Jesus the man died on the cross. Jesus the Savior is alive and well. There is a vacancy. Maybe we should book our reservations now.
Thank you, Michael. Well done. Well done. Well, before we close, it's only fitting to somehow say the following. If you're here today and you find yourself in a quandary, something that has gotten your heart, and it's impeding a relationship with Christ as both a Lord and a Savior, know that you're invited, invited to a party. You're being asked not just simply to have faith that he is who he says he is, but you're asked to get in a wheelbarrow with trust and place your life in his hands. Death is coming, as is judgment. The question is, will by his blood death pass you over, or will you find yourself seeking some explanation of your own devices? You've been given some bread today. Is today the day of your salvation? Is this something you wish to put off to another day? Really? If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, today is that day for you. What, what more do you want than God dying on your behalf and paying the price of your sin? that you might be invited to the most incredible eternal party ever. He will nourish you, he will nurture you, he will bless you, and he will guide and direct you, and he will provide for you. If there's anyone here who does not have that relationship, my guess is you were brought here today to begin it. And one way that we can do that is to confess your need of him as both Lord and Savior. We can pray for you and lead you into a personal relationship with him. Is there anyone here that needs that? Simply raise your hand. We'll do that. I will not embarrass you. If you need that relationship with Christ as Lord and you need eternal life and forgiveness of sin, simply raise your hand. We'll begin that process today. Okay. I want to encourage you and invite you to uh, spend some time getting to know Michael in the back and get to know his product. This all started on a coffee table book. There's plenty of those back there for you. A wonderful witnessing tool, good conversation piece. Take advantage of what he has there. He's like to sign a book for you. Um, he'll be here to do just that. And I, I pray that beyond that, your day will be incredibly blessed as you rest today in him and enjoy your family and all that he has for you. I want to continue to ask you to pray uh, as the Lord directs us towards um, a worship pastor going forward. As if you're not aware of it, Steve and Corey are, are leaving um, the last week in August. We're going to celebrate them going to a new position. We're very excited for him. But the Lord is already moving in that area. I just want to continue to help pray with me that we're, we're making the right decision as we go forward. Some very incredible things are, are in development, and we just need to pray those through. So as a church, let's continue to do that, okay? All right, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Get a book, make a friend, enjoy your day. We're rising from the ashes to the stars. You're the joy, 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 light in my soul. The joy, joy, joy.